name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. One God. Amen. So today is the second Sunday in the Lenten Triodion, but it's not Lent yet. We're on our way to Lent. We have a long way to go before we reach Pascha, Easter. But we are getting ready. And to get ready, we are presented with gospel readings that are often very familiar. Some of them even become favorite children's stories, like Zacchaeus, who, as uh, one four-year-old once reminded me, climbed up into the tree because he wanted, he wanted, he wanted to see God. And it's just so cute, and we love it. It's great. Other Sundays, we have stories or parables so familiar that they almost kind of breeze by, like the publican and the Pharisee. Yep, humble, proud, we know who's good, who's bad. Okay, done. And some Sundays, we get what we get today, which is a gospel that remains confronting and challenging and difficult to assimilate into a kind of easy theology. Because here comes someone who asks Jesus for help, and he compares her to a dog. Doesn't seem like what we would expect. Normally when people ask our Lord for help, he helps them. And indeed he does eventually, but why is it that we have to get through this terribly confronting scene of Jesus dismissing her or trying to dismiss her to get there? I think part of the reason is that the readings from the Gospels leading up to Lent are designed to alter our perception of ourselves, to bring us to a point of self-knowledge where repentance and the work of Great Lent can really begin. We're not quite ready for it yet. We're not quite ready to hear the hymn, Open unto us, O Lord, the gates of repentance, which we will hear in just a few weeks. But on the way, we have to get to the point where we can even think what we need is repentance. What we need is a fast. What we need is a struggle. And so last week, we have the story of Zacchaeus, whom everyone dismisses because he's a tax collector and he must therefore be a sinner. And they say, what, he's gone in to eat with a sinner? And Jesus says, no, he's a son of Abraham. People did not know who Zacchaeus was, but Jesus did. Zacchaeus knew who he was when he said, behold, I give half to the poor, right? If I've defrauded anyone, I pay them back fourfold. And there are two ways of taking that. One is that I will do this now that I've met you, Jesus. I'm going to repent and change my ways, and that's perfectly fair. But in fact, the verbs are all present tense. So he might be saying, this is what I already do. I'm already a person that others don't recognize. I'm already different than they think, but what I'm doing is the kind of work that I need to be doing, the work of repentance, the work of paying back or giving of ourselves. And next week we'll have the publican and the Pharisee, and the publican is not a good person, but he knows this about himself. Whereas the Pharisee, who has in fact done everything right, has one serious problem, which is that he doesn't know himself. He thinks he's better than others because he's done things right, and that's the problem. Then we'll have the prodigal son, who it says came to himself, came to a realization, oh my goodness, I've squandered everything, what am I doing, who am I? Wouldn't I rather be in my father's house? Wouldn't it be better to be a servant back home than to be living this wretched life? Each of these gospels is about someone realizing who they are, whether others can recognize it or not. And to some extent, that is what today's gospel is about too. The Canaanite woman knows who she is. Even when confronted with a dismissal and a dismissal that even sounds quite cruel. When Jesus says, it is not fair to give the children's bread to the dogs, she doesn't say, whoa, that's not me, or hey, that's, I, I deserve better than this, I know what's going on, or, 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 or give up. She doesn't do that either. She s responds with the most amazing combination of humility and persistence. Yes, Lord. But even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table. And this response seems to just blow Jesus' mind. He's like, whoa, wow, great is your faith. 
you can have exactly what you asked for. Be it done as you wish. I'm going to do what you want. But it's that combination that she shows of humility and persistence, which I think is rooted in an awareness of herself that is hard to attain, but which the church wants us to find and to be confronted with. That she can say, yes, you can look down on me as much as you want, and maybe I should be looked down upon, but I'm going to keep asking anyway. It does not matter how low I am seen or I feel, I'm going to keep asking and trying. Now, this isn't just for the Canaanite woman. I mean, we're, we're hearing the wonderful hymns from the meeting of our Lord in the temple on the second about Simeon, the righteous elder. All right, ticks all the boxes. He's righteous, he's old. Can't ask for better than that. And yet he had to wait and wait and wait. And with him, the prophetess Anna, who had waited for, what, 80 years? Praying in the temple, waiting and persisting, looking for the consolation of Israel, the revelation of God that no one was going to guarantee would, they would ever see. But they waited anyway. And so the Canaanite woman, though dismissed initially, shows herself to be of the same stuff, the same material, cut from the same cloth as Simeon the elder and the prophetess Anna. And when they recognize our Lord in the baby who is brought to them, so too the Canaanite woman who is not of the house of Israel, who is not looking for um, the Messiah, who is not Jewish, what, how does she greet Jesus? Lord, son of David. She knows who he is. And so, together with self-awareness, self-recognition, to which we are called, goes recognition of God, the ability to see God at work, even when it is unexpected or delayed or when we feel like we are making no progress whatsoever, like we're being dismissed or just failing. And I think these are good and helpful readings for us because you know, if you're anything like me, Lent often feels like a time of failing. You know, we're called to standards of fasting, prayer, almsgiving, which are difficult to maintain. And even if we're managing to pull off, you know, the, the vegan for Jesus level, which is how I explain fasting to people. They're always like, what's fasting? They're like, well, you go vegan, but for Jesus, and it sort of works. Anyway, if you can pull that off, that's like the bare minimum, right? And you're like, oh, well, I'm always failing, and I always feel like I'm not getting there. And I always feel like it drags on and on. And like, is Easter, is Pascha never going to come? Like, is it another six weeks, eight weeks? It's like, it's like Lent is like 2020 always, right? It just drags on. And in the midst of it, it feels like we're making no progress. Or maybe you feel differently. It's going to feel like you're waiting forever, like you're waiting for 80 years. Or it's going to feel like you're being dismissed, like you're saying, help nothing. It's going to feel like you're screaming into the void. But keep at it to an end. And in fact, there is a resurrection on the other side. And in fact, God is listening. God is with us. God is going to help as much as we may not feel like it. And so we're confronted with these readings. But if we're going to persist, it has to begin with knowing who we are and knowing who God is, knowing that God is faithful even when it doesn't seem like it, and knowing that we are in need of his help even, even when it feels like we almost can't ask for it. So I find the reading as confronting and troubling as it is to be perhaps a real aid as we prepare for Lent. Of course, if we were stuck doing this on our own, I don't think we'd have much chance. The Canaanite woman already has a faith greater than I uh, could hope for. Simeon and Anna are already so far beyond where I'm at. So how do we get there? Do we just have to keep at it on our own? Well, no. We have others. And it's always important to remember that we are surrounded by our family, our church family, that we can see, and those that we can't. 
And one reason I bring this up is that today is the feast of Saints Barsanufius and John of Gaza, who are a couple of really awesome saints. Not least because one of them is literally named Barsanufius, which is like the coolest name ever. But these were two old men who exemplify what it means to have people on your side even when you can't see it. They were recluses. They lived in cells, like little, you know, one-room buildings, uh, and did not talk to anyone directly. They communicated by letter. Uh, and so you would have the letter read to them, and then they'd respond, dictate it. And uh, they did this through a fellow named St. Dorotheos of Gaza, actually, another saint. Um, not even the abbot of the monastery got to see them. But people would write to them with questions of all kinds, and especially requests for help. And the kinds of requests that maybe we see the Canaanite woman coming to Jesus with, please heal my daughter, or please he heal me by your prayers, I know you can, right? Because these are great holy men. Everybody knows, well, if you're a holy man, you can do wonders for people. You can heal the sick. You can uh, resolve disputes. You can lecture the emperor on how he should behave. All kinds of good things, right? So people write in, and there are 848 letters from the old men uh, to monks, lay people, bishops, businessmen, farmers, and they're always asking for help. They're always saying, help me with this, help me with that. And very often, what Barsanufius or John will say is, I'll pray for you. And someone will write back maybe, no, what I really would like is to be healed. And they're like, yeah, no, I'm not gonna, I can't do that for you. I'm sorry, you're stuck with the sickness. Your illness is, 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 is what you're, you're going to be living with. And this is specifically to a monk named Andrew. And Andrew's like, well, no, I, I thought you could help me. Can't you bear my burden? And Barsanufius will respond, okay, I've asked God. I can't take it all, but I can take half. Will you let me have half your burden? You're going to have to bear the other half, but I'll bear half. And this works. Andrew says, okay, I can kind of work with that. And others, this will be if they feel that they've fallen into sin and they can't, they can't come out of it, or they're, they're, they're stuck making no spiritual progress, they'll say, bear my burden. And Barsanufius will say, mm, can't bear the whole thing, but I can take half. And so again and again, people come initially asking for a kind of easy solution. Make it go away now. And Barsanufi says, no, it's not going to go away now. You have to be persistent. You have to be as patient as Simeon, as persistent as the Canaanite woman. But I can help. Even at a distance, because of course they never see Barsanufi. They never meet him. They've never seen his face. Never will. He says, via a letter, I can help. I will pray. I'll take half your burden. And by letter, they can respond, thank you, by your prayers. And this is something, I think, that is good for us to have today as, as the saints for today, because we have a long road ahead, and it's going to feel at times like we're going it alone. And perhaps if we're in the midst of asking God and not getting the answer that we're looking for, or feeling like Easter is a long way off, or that we're not making enough progress, it can feel very isolating. And at moments like that, it's good to remember that there are saints, that there is Barsanufius, and that there is John, and so, so, so many others who may not be able to make it all go away or all get better right now, and who can't necessarily bear the whole burden, but who are ready to take half, and who are always there interceding on our behalf. And whether that be the saint whose name we share, or another to whom we're particularly devoted, or a couple of cool guys from Gaza that you just heard about today. The saints are with us. And so, as we face the challenging weeks that lie ahead, and as we struggle to find our own humility and persistence to know ourselves and to know God, and to come closer through that, we can rely on the saints to bear at least half our burden. And with that encouragement, I'll let you to the rest of it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Rejoice, oh.